Hey, what is up, players? It is Warboss Tay up in his mug. Welcome to my How to Paint a Crix Warjack Part 2. This is the final part of the video. You can see our finished product here. I think he looks great. That muted green, the silver and the gold, they pop really, really nicely. What I'm showing you right now is that something I did not do in the video because I hadn't really realized it until after was that this guy's got some rivets and in his shoulder pads. So I just took a little bit of that belcher to them. I think that's the only thing after I film this video that is not included in the tutorial. So the paints you're going to need for this model are Castle and Green, Retributor Armor Gold, and uh, that's how we highlight our gold back up. I'm also using Rune Fang Steel to get a nice bright silver and Dawnstone as a highlight color. Then I'm using this Vallejo model color white 70.951. I have had it with Games Workshop Ceramite White and White Scar. I am just done with both of them. I think I, there are three or four pots that I bought. Coelia Green Shade, BL10 Green. But I am so sick and tired of them. The, they clump up, they dry out, and no matter what I do, I think there was a brand new white scar paint that I had purchased and I'd gotten home and uh, I'd opened it and it was kind of usable. The next day it was completely separated and I just, I couldn't, I couldn't take it anymore. So Vallejo's white is just perfect. It's fantastic. I'm never going to go back to Games Workshop's whites unless they uh, fix the product. And so <laughs> that's, that's my little mini rant over. All right, so what I'm doing now is I'm going to take our castle in green. Remember, the last thing we did with this model was we took some known oil and we just shaded down the pretty much the entire model. And uh, after we had let it dry, I'm taking my castle in green now and I'm basically building the color back up. My theory, my painting theory for getting to uh, rebuild a color, especially after you've taken it down a shade or you've, you've used a wash or a shade to mute it, is to start with the upper areas. You see I started at the center of the plate and drag it down. And uh, rather than starting in the middle and going outwards or starting at the bottom and going to the top, try to find where the light would, would most naturally hit it the most and then build out my, uh, I guess, my, my paint from there. One of the things I'm looking at doing when I'm uh, highlighting a model also is making sure that my if I'm if I'm highlighting or re-highlighting and bringing the colors back up on a large plate like this a large flat surface area and if I've taken the wash and just pretty much spread it over the entire thing uh, I'm very careful about my paint strokes because we want the wash to stay nice and dark in the joining areas where the lines are that separate the uh, the materials. So if you look at the top plate right behind the guy's head, the green center section, the flat area, we want a little bit of shade right where it meets the gold. And if we can do that for all of our areas, keep that darkness, keep that shaded uh, darker area nice and shadowed, then um, that's going to really help us when we're building up our highlights. We won't have to work so hard because we'll have more of a contrast between the brighter and the darker areas. You'll notice also that one of my favorite strokes when painting is a vertical paintbrush stroke. That's because my hand naturally goes uh, and does that vertical stroke easier than it does doing a horizontal. And if I have to do a horizontal paint stroke, like for example, that lower plate area on a shoulder pad, I would turn the model so that I'm doing just a vertical stroke, but in a horizontal way on the actual model. I think everybody's different, you know, and you'll find after you paint a bunch of models, which direction you like to shade with the most. If you're not sure, this is a very easy way to figure it out. Just take a pencil, and a sheet of paper and draw a circle and shade the lower half of it to create shadow. And if you find yourself doing vertical shades, uh, strokes to create the shading, then 
you're obviously more comfortable like that. If you find yourself doing broad horizontal strokes, then you're more comfortable with that. Some people also do a diagonal paint stroke, and uh, I think having all three in your arsenal is really, really great because then you can vary your strokes and you won't have to be kind of nailed into one specific way of painting. Um, for example, I try to be as diverse as possible. Naturally, the vertical for me is, is the easiest though. Okay, now we're into our Retributor Armor. I love this color. If you're going for a gold, a yellow gold, nice and clean and uh, just very, very good coverage, then this is uh, reminds me of the Vallejo, the oil or enamel paints, their um, liquid gold range. I think Games Workshop has cracked the code on that. It has made such a such a great advance with these base colors, these base metallics. Balthazar Gold, I think, was the first one that really just stood out for me as being the uh, optimal step up from their Shining Gold in the previous range and their Dwarf Bronze, both of which were great colors, but they were layer paints. And really, you can't just put that paint onto a primered model. It's going to separate. You're going to see through it to the, the coat underneath. What I had to do, if you remember my videos, was from back in the day, was put a layer of kelp in brown or graveyard earth. And it's so time consuming to have to do that. This is really much, much easier, much more efficient. Just uh, take your Retributor armor and just go to work. You'll see that I put some Retributor armor accidentally. I got some of it onto the green plate on his hand there, if you look at the area that I'm focused on. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to take my Castellan green, and if you check out how I'm holding the model, it's a little bit blurry right now, but look how my fingers are holding it. I've got my middle finger pressed up against the, the base, and then my thumb is hooking it around the other side to kind of hold it in place. I'm not using my uh, cork base for this because it's a large model, so I'm able to kind of hold it. But really, if you want to have the best kind of uh, grip without hurting your hand or doing any kind of damage to your, your hand, then I would suggest using a cork base or handle. A lot of you have seen the, the piece of cork that I use. And all you do is go to the angle of paint stroke that you're most comfortable with, in my case, a kind of vertical stroke, and carefully line in that green color. All right, this was a tricky one to figure out. I had to look at a bunch of different privateer press pictures because I really wanted to figure out what, what color do we go with for our highlight for the green. So it's Dawnstone. It's kind of like a gray color. And what I did was, I it's not straight Dawnstone. I added just a little bit of Castellan Green so that it can create a better transition between the green plate and the gray that we're going for as the highlight color. Yeah, so basically what I'm doing is I'm taking my Dawnstone, I'm making sure that the tip of my brush is very sharp, very pointed. Uh, again, if you are someone who gets in the habit of dipping your paintbrush all the way into a pot of paint, or even if you're setting your paint into a wet palette, which I recommend, and then just dabbing your paintbrush in and stabbing it and getting the paint all up in the ferrule, then that's not going to be good, and you're probably not going to be able to get uh, the fine tip that you want. The ferrule, again, for those of you who don't know or maybe are, are new to painting, is the metal binding that holds the bristles to the wooden handle of the paintbrush. And when paint gets stuck in there, then it dries and it pulls the bristles apart. And it's really bad for your brush. It can basically ruin your brush if you don't clean it. And even though there are some products out there that are great at cleaning acrylic paint out of the ferrule of brushes if you soak it, and uh, just thoroughly give it a good cleaning. You can save yourself a lot of time and effort and money from either having to buy those products and then wait and, and go in there and, and get your brushes cleaned up. And even like I did, if my bristles kind of frayed and when I first started painting, there was nobody on YouTube. YouTube was the un undiscovered country that would say, hey, there's these great products for painters not just miniature painters, but if you look in the arts and crafts section, 
of your local craft store, then you can get some of this terrific paint cleaner, brush cleaner. Didn't know that. Ended up spending a lot more money than I needed to and just dumping brushes as they got old. Again, this is not to say that you should go out and buy also like a, a $10 pack from Michaels of, you know, 80 brushes because I did that once for, for a terrain project. You might remember my square terrain project that I did for Idic Beer a couple years back. I bought this what I thought was a great value of a paintbrush set, and it uh, turns out most of those brushes were pretty, pretty terrible. So uh, you get what you pay for. All right, I, I basically took Dawnstone to every single plate of of the uh, green armor there, and now I'm going to take Runefang Steel and lightly highlight any of the silver areas that are reflected in the light. So because of the known oil shade, this is going to give you a terrific kind of, I guess, canvas to to look at. If you're a new painter to this highlighting and shading business, then what I did a lot of times with my orcs from my orcs and goblins from my Warhammer Fantasy was I just kind of let the shade sit. And I thought it was so great to have this natural shading that I, I didn't want to highlight the model. And I just kind of would leave more of my models just shaded. And if you want a regular, just tabletop standard, I've seen a lot of people who just base coat and shade their models and, and leave it. And they get a lot more painted that way. But uh, on the other hand, it's not, I don't think it's as as good. You get a much better finish, basically, is what I'm saying. If you if you highlight your models, shade them and highlight. It's that extra touch that a lot of people will appreciate. All right, so here I am basically highlighting all of the silver bits with my Runefang steel, and I want to kind of create a an oily, used, uh, just really grimy and uh, dark look to the steel. Now we're lucky because there's a lot of silver on this model. Most of the underworkings are silver. I think the Crix faction is not one to have too much ostentation. So while there is some gold and uh, some gold accents, a lot of the model, the underside is going to be this dark iron that I was talking about. So you, all you really have to worry about is where, where are the most interesting looking surfaces that we can really bring up that silver on. All right, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how I paint the glowy green bits. And I'm starting with 70.951 of the Vallejo range. It is just white. It's called just basically white. And it is my favorite white color. Like I said in the beginning, after so many pots of even going back to the old skull white, and especially with the newer range, ceramite white, white scar, I think the best white paint that Games Workshop has right now is Othuan Gray. And it's like like it says, more of a gray than a white, but you can really highlight up to Ultha One Gray and not worry too much about people thinking that it's it's not white, because it's it's pretty light up there. So as you can see, what I'm doing is I put some of that white on the tip of my brush and then I'm holding the model so that I'm painting these lines horizontally. And you can see because of the angle of the model, I'm I'm getting a little bit in or onto the ribs of the of the Crick's Warjack. So when the model or when the video kind of skips to the next clip, I'm going to be cleaning that up. Basically just going back over it with Lead Belcher and then Runefang Steel. The reason why I'm doing this after the Runefang Steel highlights and not before is because I want to already know where the natural light is going to fall on the model. When it has that Runefang Steel highlight, it's good to know, okay, where where is the silver already going to be nice and bright so I can bring that back up if I make a mistake with my white paint. So again, just take your the tip of your paintbrush and just line it into all the fine areas between the ribbing on on the model.
So here we go, I'm just going back in with my Rune Fang Steel and bringing up some of that fine highlight. And then when the video cuts, I'm going to line some of the areas that are a little bit too close to the white with some lead belcher. Okay, now we're going to move on to our Coelia Green Shade. This is a beautiful dark green, and uh, it's great for when you're doing ghostly effects like we want to do, to do as a first shade color. We're going to follow this up with BL10 Green in a second, but when you're painting the Coelia Green Shade, you don't want to completely black out that white paint. It's very, very easy to do that because the, the pigment is so thick and dark that when you're putting your green shade in, it might look great because it, it creates this beautiful contrasting green color, but you got to remember that we have one more, one more step up to go for our shading, so we don't want it to look too dark and too green. Also, when we're painting into these areas, it's very easy for your Coelia green shade to get in onto the silver ribs, which is another reason why I'm waiting for the video to kind of jump ahead between clips to clean that up because uh, you don't want too much of that green shade on your on your silver parts. So again, I'm holding my model from a more horizontal angle so I can get in there really easily. And adding our BL10 green is, what it kind of is going to do is it's going to blend the dark green of the Coelia green shade and kind of give it a little bit more depth and kind of pull it up from that really dark Coelia color to, <laughs> I don't even know if I'm pronouncing it right, to a lighter green. Now what you can do if you really want to get fancy, and uh, I do this for some of my models where you, it, the color is a little bit more prominent, take a little bit of Flash Gets Yellow and thin it down with some water on your wet palette and just very, very lightly take that and use it kind of as a glaze to color in the, the most important parts of these green shaded areas. So like the eyes, that's what I did for the eyes. And uh, it comes out really looking nice because you've got a dark green that blends into a lighter green that blends into a yellow and creates a very cool spooky effect. You can even use moot green as a as a mid-step for that. Um, and that's fine too. I, I like just going with the flash gets yellow. And there you have it. Thank you so much for watching. This is our finished model. Basically, we're just going to let it dry. And like I said in the beginning, I'm going to be painting up some lead belcher into the rivets on the shoulder pads. But that is your Crix Warjack. You can use this kind of color scheme for most any of the Crix projects that you have. And I think they are going to look really, really terrific. Hey, thanks for watching, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this video. And we will see you in the next one. Thumbs up.